Welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Andrea. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for continuing with us at this for this last section of the event. Let me briefly tell you what is the purpose of this segment. First of all, I would like to tell you what we have we, we what we have been working on at LACNIC in terms of technology. There are three or four things that are interesting that we would like to share with you. And I would also like to introduce a colleague and friend, Elisa Peirano, who has been working for us for quite some time now. She's part of a research and development team, and she will maintain all the speakers aligned. So I now give the floor to Elisa. Elisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you, everyone, for being with us this afternoon. Before starting, let me remind you that throughout the entire session, you can ask your questions in the Q&A box. And at the end, we will try to answer all the questions that you write. Now, yes, let us start with a video clip where we have Gerardo Rado, who is a leader of software development at LACNIC, and he'll share the tool with us like which is called LACNIC query. The idea is to centralize access to the different databases. There is a lot of information that is provided through different protocols. Well, we have a web interface that does passing of the address. They look up the information and then use websites for users who do not don't know how to use who is. They can use this in the website. Then we had RDAP and we had the answers in JSON and this is more automated, um, capable of being automated. Then you had the key value and quite long text. And then we also had apps that passed the information. I'm sorry, there's an issue with the connection somehow. So then we had systems where we access the data directly and showed the information in websites, not directly the content like we received it originally, but also passed, and it is available in a more user-friendly version. We had delegation files and sub-delegation files, IRR systems who have their own who is, websites that passed the information and processed to show it in a more user-friendly manner. So in this way, we had different systems. And then we didn't even speak of RPKI, for example. So we now have this integrating application. Technically speaking, this application had some challenges when developing an app that centralizes the processes we saw that we included just one point of failure. If we, we tell the users, well, here you do all the queries, but if that place fails, then we all have problems for accessing the information and the entire systems. Another important point is the performance. How did we solve the problem? For all those users who access different systems now got together in just one to provide a quality service. So one of the solutions is to make our back ends more robust. The HUD is the RDAP, the IRR had their own developments and adjustments last year in order to improve the response for each of these. In some cases, the geographical distribution. In some other cases, there are there's horizontal scalability. So we became a back end that is ready to be accessed massively. The second solution that we implemented with LACNIC is a client side application. In other words, it runs on the user side. On the user side, you have a JavaScript which allows you to allow access the different back ends and then present the public information available in 
So if someone asks it from the application, this is done through the application where this application runs. And the third measure that we took has to do with maintaining all the other channels available. So all the applications that existed, and many of, you, of us did not use these, well, these are still there and available to be used, although we now have this other solution. Now, how do we access LACNIC queries? In the website of LACNIC, we go to the quiz, you click there. This is not click new query. You click on the magnifying glass, you include your IP address, and this redirects to the Milaknik query, but you can search by IPs, but also by contacts, organizations, autonomous systems, IPv6, and of course, IPv4. For each of these queries, the system gives you the who is information, the IRR information, the RDAP information, and the embedded RDAP information. What is the future of this application? Well, these components that you have on the vertical side a, a, a column, you have information from the C certs on security or other types of public information or compiled public information, which can be of use for our members. So thank you. And now we go back to the power of technology. Thank you, Gerardo. That is very interesting how we can integrate access to the different databases of LACNIC. This information that you have in LACNIC query can be out of date or can show some errors. So we'll now watch another video with Gerardo where he shows us how LACNIC tools, another tool, allows us with these versions. Second video, please. LACNIC tools have some specific features. It has modules for information, or you can have access to information on LACNIC's database. And through these mechanisms, you can do the LACNIC query. It also has modules that are didactic modules. They show you how to use some of the tools. On the other hand, you can have reports containing information on the stored data in LACNIC's database and also recommendations on reports or warning on errors and how to improve this. We're going to see how LACNIC tools work. First, how do you access LACNIC tools? You go to the website of LACNIC and in the options menu, you will find LACNIC tools. You click there and this takes you to this tool. Once you are there, you're going to find reports related to the companies that are associated to LACNIC. So you can write the identifier for that company, but you can also write the autonomous system or an IP address. So it, through the three, these three paths, you can obtain the report associated to that company. All the information here has been compiled and you have a report that might be useful. Now, the first thing we find are all those addresses that are associated to this organization. And based on that, we have all the resources for that organization. Let's look at the first module, who is and LACNIC query. Here you have the preloaded information related to the who is information and which are the IP addresses, the information on who is, on our tab. We have information as to how to run the who is commands and how to get the IRR. Then we have a link for LACNIC query to obtain all this information. The second module is BGP and RPKI. Through this module, you'll have a overview, rapid overview. And then you have all the rowers that have been created, the valid and valid ones, and the recommendation of the pending rowers. The third module has to do with RDNS. Here you'll find information related to the correctness of the data if these are properly configured or not configured or invalid data. Let us look at the details. The first thing you have is a report showing the validity of the announcements, of the IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes. The second part shows a detail 
of the rowers that we have created. You can download the information to view it as text and then copy it and put it at Milaknik. Or you can also create a rower and it directs you to the Milaknik system, which preloads the rower information. And finally, you will find a kind of looking glass showing the announcements of the autonomous systems. And if you go to the RDNS module, you will see a screen with the statistics on the correctness of this information, the ones that were done, that were not done, and the error messages. And an addition that this report has is that if we go to this view, you can check the RDNS here. You can you have the run command and then the association to the re registers. And you can also check if there is a kind of alert. And you can also check whether reverse for this server has been properly configured. In this case, we received an error. So this server is not associated to it. And finally, we have a kind of list of the PKI objects associated to the organization. So you can view the contents of these objects. If we want to return to the start screen, you click on start. And this is LACNIC tools. So we go back to Elisa. Thank you once again. These tools of Milaknik are also very useful. We'll now continue with a presentation by Guillermo Sicileo. Guillermo is a research and development leader in internet infrastructure, and who will tell us about some studies and analyses of Lacnic in the region and some of the interactive reports. Guillermo, you have the floor. Thank you, Elisa. The idea of this section is to share with you some of the studies we carried out over the past year and some of the new sites that have to do with these studies. As regards the studies, these are in a section of the web, which is called technical reports. These reports were carried out by different people as part of one of our projects, which is to carry out studies that have to do with the stability and the resiliency of the internet. So we entrusted different studies to consultants who supported us in this task. Some of these you have already seen. For example, connectivity in the LAC region that has to do with a study that was carried out analyzing the latency in the countries of the region. This measures many things, but among other things, which is the internal latency in each country and also what is the latency between countries. In other words, the pass between one country and the rest or from another region to a given country. So all that information can be found. We have an article at LACNIC Labs on this topic. Here you have the URL and also the complete study and a poster was presented at LACNIC 35's virtual fair, which you can also see. The, uh, here you have a couple of graphs. But one of the interesting things is the cluster analysis regarding the connectivity carried out by the study. This determines which are the groups of countries that have the best connectivity with one another, depending on the latency. As I was saying, this is focused on latency. The methodology has been described in detail in the study. You can read it if you wish. There was a webinar organized on this some months ago. But there is another study 
that is also related to this. This is the study on BGP interconnection in the LAC region. The author is Agustin Maturin. The previous one was done by Agustin Formoso. This is a different focus and it's based on the global BGP routing tables. It analyzes the data that have to do with the operator's interconnection. It has a series of features on the different countries and on the region in general. Here we obtain data on the amount of autonomous systems, the amount of prefixes announced by the countries, as well as the autonomous systems. Systems that give transit in each country and upstream autonomous systems in each country. So that's uh interesting information that gives us uh, an idea of the diversity of the internet in a country so as we have more upstream providers that gives us more resilience more possibilities for redundance and not to depend uh, on just a few and on the other hand the transit autonomous systems also give us uh, and those that originate uh, prefixes gives an idea of the evolution of the internet in each country. And there you can also see some charts showing how, uh, showing the traffic or the direction of most connections of each country. All this is analyzing the BGP tables. And for each country, you have a table of this kind. I also invite you to see the entire uh, study and the poster that was presented in um, the virtual uh, trade show uh, where you can see a summary of the data. But the, the, the full information is in the poster. Another study that has to do with uh, the so-called stabi internet stability and resilience is the use of uh, DNS root servers in the region. And this was by Hugo Salgado. What we wanted to know here was a bit um, the current status of um, the access to root servers from each country in the region and the region in general. For that purpose, we used uh, the RIPE Atlas probes. If you don't know it, it uh, please, we invite you to become familiar with them. And if possible, maybe you can host a probe of a uh, Atlas RIPE that is good for this project and for others. There are hardware and software probes, but anybody can host a software probe. The study conducts um, uh, IPv4 uh, DNS uh, queries. The idea is to extend it to IPv6, but the problem is that, as I was telling you, these probes, we need to install more probes to provide more information, but the problem is that there were just a few in IPv6. So based on those uh, uh, queries, we determine an average and a mean time of response uh, of each country to each root server. And you can see things like this, for instance. To your right, you see that you see well the the time of the queries to the uh, root servers these little dots if you look at them here throughout time you see that the chart changes and you see that the latencies improve these are latency values that uh, are reduced and they tend to get accumulated in this area. So this means that we are improving. So I, once again, I invite you to read the complete study. Finally, another study that we have that maybe is not as well known is the IPv6 support and IPv6 mechanisms of support in the CPEs in the customer premises equipment. Last year, there was an update. And the idea of this was to have information on, on the one hand, the, the CPEs, the customer premises equipment that were most popular in the region, and who and what CPE models and what transition mechanisms were supported. Basically, what CPE models 
are supported by the CPEs in the region. So this is oriented to fixed network uh, uh, technologies with ADSL, uh, DOCSIS, and FTTH. And here you have the complete report in this link, in the LACNIC website. And here you have a pie showing the most supported um, technologies um, uh, in the region. This is not in general, but uh, for those uh, that, uh, that the operators in the region support it or report it. So the second part of this presentation has to do with sites, with this information. Well, some of the information has to do with the studies and the information here is shown uh, interactively. So we have on the one hand, the measurements to root servers. Here I have uh, the link. You can uh, enter here. This is new. So, so if you find errors or if you find things that uh, you don't think are right, maybe you can give us a hand. And well, this site is interactive and we collect the statistics and uh, this is regenerated every three months. There you can see different views. You can go through the website, for instance, looking at the response times from one country to each server or the averages or the mean values for all uh, the uh, um, root servers. So another website that has to do with the previous studies is that of BGP in Latin America and the Caribbean, BGP routing. And here I invite you to visit this site and uh, to let us know if you find things that you find are wrong. And it's interesting because here you can see not just information on the prefixes, the lengths of the prefixes, that is in the end, the idea to analyze, uh, the idea of analyzing it was to see whether we had a growth of the, IP, of the announced IPv4 uh, addresses as the IP before addresses got exhausted. We noticed that the countries with more operators, the announced prefixes are longer than in those that have fewer operators and certainly must have more addresses. So, and this also reports for each country, you can see the autonomous systems of origin, the upstreams, and the transit autonomous systems and a lot of information. Finally, let me tell you about the fourth project. We've uh, mentioned it more than once, but I, as we have a different audience, maybe you are not familiar. This is the fourth monitoring. What it does is it processes the updates of BGPs of the global uh, tables, the route views and write periods take the BGP tables of all over the world together with the RPKI information provided by Ford and Rutinator, plus information of the RIRs. And it analyzes the updates, the BGP updates and classifies them depending on whether they are covered by ROA, if they are registered uh, in uh, the RIR, if they detect any uh, anomalies uh, in the information of the RPKI and uh, RIR. And uh, it also uh, conducts a study of the evolution uh, with time. So you can visit that here. And finally, I wanted to tell you of InfoRedis. This is a website that is based on RIPSTAT, but it's a website in LACNIC where we, we, and we have adapted the information of the RIPSTAT widgets so as to have data we consider interesting. It provides data on IPv4, IPv6 addresses and autonomous systems, specifically on routing, connectivity, RPPKI, DNS, and other information that may be of use for network operators. If you go to this website, you'll see the different widgets and you'll see things that you may 
uh, report, for instance, the number of uh, IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes that are announced from the autonomous systems, how they evolve with time. This one here shows the lengths of the AS paths of the autonomous systems. So there you can put an autonomous system or an IP, and it will give you a lot of information, for instance, from issues from RPKI, RIR, whether they're configured or not, whether they are RUAC covered or not, etc. For instance, you can see the BGP announcements. What's very useful is to be able to see the history of uh, those announcements with time. If uh, it has, if the, the announcements always came from the same autonomous systems. And so I invite you to take a look at this page, at this website, and if you see any problems, please report them. So that's all I had. Thank you. And now I give the floor to Elisa. Thank you, Guillermo. Thank you for sharing this information. It's very interesting for network operators and for those who want to uh, conduct more research on these topics. Remember that you can ask questions in the Q&A panel and we are going to um, answer them at the end of the session. Now we'll update the RPKI. There's a video again by Gerardo. The video please. About RPKI, we have three news. The first is that we have implemented an RGP. Then we have advances in the geographic distribution of those RPKIs. And the third is the implementation of the policy requesting the creation of an ROA with ASN0 for the resources. The reminder is that we have a protocol available where we delegate the responsibility of the management and the user. So let's see each in depth, the RDDP, RPKI repository of the protocol that enables to publish the differences between a previous generation of the repository and the current. And this has two important uh, impacts. One is that the protocol makes it makes the protocol available through HTTP. And the second is that the times are shortened. Once the RPKI information is modified, that information becomes available in the repository a few minutes later. With the appearance of RDDP, there's no need to update the uh, uh, root uh, uh, file. So we are coordinating with the programmers of each of the validators available in the market so that they may include the new TAL in their implementation. The new TAL has what was available in the past, plus the URL for the repository. The fact, a fact of making this uh, available opens uh, a fan of opportunities. So far, we have the repository available in the data center of Sao Paulo and and at the center of the video. The, the other news is the implementation of LAC uh, 2019 too. ROAs, RPKI, with, and here the policy requests that for the non assigned resources, the ROA must tell that the origin is ASN0. And this has its own uh, tag that is the ARC anchor of, uh, of a trust and we also have a contact with the programmers of the different implementations of the validators so that they will include this done. Finally, remember that the up down protocol available in RPKI through these services, you'll be able to manage your own being independent, for instance, to create ROAs for your customers or to create personalized services. Thank you. Thank you, Gerardo. It's good to see how the RPKI technology grows and grows and gets consolidated every year. Finally, we have Guillermo Pereira, security analyst of LACNIC, detection of open resolvers. That's his presentation. Guillermo, thank you. Good morning. Sobre detección de open resolvers en la región. I'm going to share with you some of the projects we carried out regarding open resolvers in the region. 
and the idea is to identify the open resolvers in the region and warn and recommend best practices to those who were affected and the community and to assess the effectiveness of the communications channels for the purpose of reporting. So what is a DNS open resolver? These are DNS servers that accept recursive queries so anyone can make these queries. Now, why are these a problem? The first or the main thing are the amplification attacks, the denial of service attacks by amplification because these servers receive the query, they multiply the query several times. And here you have a document showing that in lab environments, we obtained a 28 and 64 times amplification. And in the case of the replies, 18 to 20 times amplification. So this is a serious problem. And for attackers, this is a useful tool to amplify their attacks because they have uh, several infected machines and they can carry out the attack massively and also multiply it several times. Other possible problems are these. They enable undesired traffic in your server. Nobody wishes to obtain this kind of traffic in their servers. They are susceptible to cache poisoning. These are techniques to replace authoritative domains. They can create malicious tunnels if a machine is infected in a company and the firewall does not enable certain ports. Normally, the DNS port is left open so that you can browse in the internet so the attackers can use these tunnels. And through their botnet, they can use these open resolvers. They can also attack a NX domains to do queries in non-existent domains. And also with, this can done, be done with subdomains. You also have the phantom domain attacks. In this case, the attackers do queries to your server, but this query is to a server that is controlled by them. It is authoritative server controlled by them. So this allows them to respond with packets that are not well formed or hundreds of subdomains with spoofed IPs so that they can do an amplification attack. And because these attackers use the IP of your open resolver, your IP or the range of IPs can fall into the blacklist. And this is, of course, is something that is undesired. We carried out two projects, one with IPv6 and one with IPv4. In the case of IPv6, this was active and done together with LACNIC's IT uh, from LACNIC. The idea was to identify the IPv6 servers that were open in the region, and then we sent out regular alerts through MeLACNIC and by email whenever we detect an IPv6 open resolver, and these notify on a weekly basis, those who are affected. And then with LACNIC CSERT, we carried out the DNS open resolvers with IPv4. The idea was to identify the servers using open IPv4 in the region, in different worlds, so they can enter the website and look at, you can access the website and see the details on these two projects. Some of the external statistics are the ones that were obtained. Here you have daily stats of shadow server. We see what is happening out there with the open resolvers. In average, there are 2 million open, open, sorry, open DNS resolvers. And these are the statistics of Cloudflare. And here you have the DNS attacks, the attacks by DNS. These are maintained. There are rank fourth, so this is used quite a lot by attackers after UDP, RSD, and SIP. 
The project stages for IP4 and V6, I mentioned this already, the idea is to identify the open resolvers in the region and to warn those who are affected, recommending best practice to figure out solutions for this. These are some of the statistics on IPv6. This is by RIR. We detected these by re RIRs. Irene is at the forefront. They are the ones who have the largest amount of open resolvers compared to the other RIRs. In LACNIC, we also have some. And APNIC hasn't had that amount of open resources detected. These are the results for LACNIC. These are those that were detected month by month after creating this project. This started to drop in 2020. And then it started growing gradually. The last bar here, the one in March, shows that none have been detected at in the Lacnic region. On the other hand, the IPv4 results, we used a different technique here. Here we identified these 36,000 open resolvers. We managed to lower the amount significantly with the project over time of those who were affected. This compares the open resolvers in the past 60% of all DNSs were open. Those who had the port open 60% had open resolvers, and this was decreased to 39%. A couple of considerations. These are the results for the IPv4 project. Of those who were warned, only 3% responded, and of the emails we used, we used those that are published in WHOIS. We obtained 10% of rebounds. So there are many emails that are not working many of the who is mailboxes and there are hundreds of vulnerable cpes one of these was corrected including a firewall so that in that case one installed a firewall but the other one of the others asked the provider to take action so we decreased a number of problems. And in general, sending massive email was the best option compared to Milaknik and direct contact. Well, and a couple of recommendations of links when you buy a CPE, you really have to pay attention not to leave an open port in our website we explain how to correct the well-known DNS servers such as Bind or, for example, Microtik. All these are in our website, and you can see how you can solve those issues with the routers. So if you have any questions, you can send write to us, or you can also access the website for further information. Thank you, Guillermo. Great information. For those of you who were at the tutorial of Nico, Antonio, and Carlos, understand the importance of this topic. So security is a very important topic for all of us. That is why we would like to take the opportunity how VLACNIC has a second authentication factor now. We will show you a video clip containing this information. The video, please. LACNIC shares with you the new authentication service with two factors. Authentication of two factors is a method that confirms that a user is who they state they are, combining two different components. This combines the, the identity of a user with a password and a factor different to the to the past one. In the case of MeLACNIC, we created a series of digits with an authentic authenticating device. To use this service before entering me, likely you have to download a two-factor app. You access Nilagnik with your username and password, the menu 2FA from the start page or from the profile of the user to configure a second authentication process. You have to at least have an alternative email. 
how can you add an alternative email to include it in your profile, fill in the field and press click and click on add. Once you have the secondary email, this has to be confirmed by the user. Please confirm that you have read and accept the conditions and this will be confirmed by a system. Milaknik goes back to the profile of the user to refresh your session. Your user is now ready to enable a second authentication authentication factor. How can you enable a second authentication factor? With the app in your device, you can scan the QR code from the camera of the app. Once you generate the six digit code, you can enter the information in your Milaknik session ready. Your second authentication factor has been enabled. Important. For the proper use of this tool, we recommend download the authentication codes for unique access in the case you lose your device, then maintain access to your email and to maintain your contact telephone up to date. In case you lose your authenticator, first use one of your security codes for cases where you lose the device. It is important to having downloaded the file with the 10 security codes and save it in a secure environment. In case you use the file, generate all the security codes. Once again, the security code of unique use is the one that has to do with the one you generated here. How do you generate the security unique access code? One of the security codes has been previously downloaded and stored in a secure site. Each code, a security code, can be used only once. These codes can be generated once again individually or all together in order to obtain the 10 usable codes. Two, configure a new authenticator and disable other devices. Enter the configuration with a two-factor authenticator downloaded in the second device you scan the qr code with the camera access the generated code in the corresponding field in milaknik how can you add new authenticators apply this mechanism in the case of you have more than one device access to the configuration with a two-factor authenticator, you scan the QR code with the camera of your app. Access the generated code in the field and Milaknik. How can you eliminate the two-factor authentication service? Access the configuration and disable the second factor. Thank you. This was the last topic we had for the time for technology. Very interesting, all the updates that you shared with us. Carlos, are there any questions? There are no questions for the time being, so you can start sending in your questions through the Q&A. The Q&A is down here, down here, around there. It's very difficult to follow the chat otherwise so far. No questions have been sent, but I have a question. So while we wait for people to ask their questions, I would like to ask Guillermo. And now we have two Guillermos. I'd like to ask Guillermo Sicilio to tell us a little more or to repeat something that is very important, which is the invitation to host Atlas probes, which allows us to make better measurements. And we think this is very important. Yes, thank you, Carlos. As I was saying, the majority or rather many of these projects are based, not all, but some are based something happened. The audio has been interrupted. All right. You were, you were interrupted, the, the communication was interrupted, Guillermo. Well, I was telling you that if you access this site, you can see how you can install probes. These probes are constantly measuring and checking things, and they have some embedded measurement options, and some can be added. So you can make your own measurements. 
And one of the good things about this is that you have probes in different parts of the world, all over the world, rather. So you can carry out these measurements from certain regions and see how you can reach certain sites or from different autonomous systems and so on. So you can select these options and also limit this to a given system of autonomous systems, countries, etc. Dejo acá el link para que vean, es un proyecto de RIPE, ¿no? Pero eh, cualquier duda nos pueden contactar para, para ver cómo... This ponerlo. is a RIPE project, but if you have any doubt, you can uh, contact us. As a matter of fact, Elisa, last year, coordinated a sort of a hackathon for installing RIPE probes. Yes, indeed. Indeed, I think that this year they're going to hold another one. I don't know when, but I'm going to send you the information when that happens. If you Would you like to say any... Anything about the uh, last hackathon? Yes. Last year, by the end of the year, with RIPE uh, to promote uh, the software uh, probes, it was very good. But of course, we welcome more. So any question you may have, we can help you step by step. Just that. Very good. Yes, the Atlas uh, probes are just uh, hardware that are sent, the, the, the typical ones are uh, hardware, but now there's a, it's a software that uh, is installed, I have at home, and it's running, and it's just as a, a hardware probe. We have a question. I think that Gerardo already answered it. And uh, I think that there are no more questions. Gerardo, would you like to say anything about uh, why we did the ASN uh, zero and TAL separately? Yes, let me tell you that the effect indeed, the TAL is separated and to include that ROA with the assigned resources. You have to configure a different uh, TAL for ASN0. I think that this has to do with the possibility for the operator to include that ROA with the outer validation. So that would then complement the idea. Now it's Perfect. Well, there's a, an interest, a very interesting semantic issue. You'll see the discussions in the IETF and in some operation groups. Uh, the ROAs usually are positive statements. That is, is, everything in this autonomous system complies with MaxLen uh, is must be permitted. But the ROA of ASN zero has a negative semantic, that is, everything in AS and zero should not be in the routing table. So indeed, it may be complex to create policies in the routers that use the source of information in such a different way. So I'm paying attention to uh, uh, the some, we, we decided to do it in a separate tandem. I think, well, I was answer, I was writing to Emmanuel. Emmanuel was asking what can be done with the probes that are damaged. It's, it's easier to say it in the mic. What you can do is you can ask for a new one or you can reinstall the software, but there's a guideline in the right side that tells you what to do when it fails. And sometimes you can uh, resuscitate it, yes. Sometimes it's only changing the memory card, the pen drive, or sometimes just rebooting it, resetting it, removing it from there and reformatting the file system and putting it again. Sometimes you can solve it like that, exactly. So Eli, you, I give you the floor because we have 15 seconds. Well, thank you. With this, we conclude the technology hour. 
Thank you again, everyone, for having been with us in this space. And now I give the floor to Andrea 